We have a very special guest and lecturer today. Her name is Judy Key Johnson. She is both, both an inspiration and leader for entrepreneurs and female executives. I'm proud to say that she's a mentor and has helped many people and individuals start and improve their business practices globally. Judy holds a bachelor's degree from Pomona College, Claremont, a master's in business administration and finance from San Jose University. Judy was an executive and director at IBM Corporate Communications in Armonk, New York, and managed the international business operations for the one billion OEM disk drive business systems. As program director of global systems, Judy led the first four SAP projects in the IBM Corporation, a four-year, $80 million project. I'm happy to say in 1996, a group of investors asked Judy to join Fieldcentrics. This is a wireless software company, and she was the first full-time president and wrote a business plan that raised over $37 million in venture funding. She later sold the company to a Fortune 50 company named Astia. Judy has come out of retirement and founded KMG to help other entrepreneurs and startups and business-to-business -business clients since 2002. Clients range from large manufacturing to small business professionals. Her team of experts specialize in online marketing strategies and have proven to be exceptionally effective in strategizing and increasing sales and revenue. The key marketing group are data oriented and base their strategies on defined results. Judy sits on various boards and advisory boards, including being the chief marketing officer for search engine optimizations, SEO, company since 1998. So as Tom said before, Judy's topic today is developing a powerful online lead generation engine and how to write your own success. Please give Judy Johnson a very warm welcome. Thank you very much, Dr. Ferber. It's a pleasure to be here and thank you in person audience and online audience as well. And what a great time for us to kick this off because it's the first week of the new year and for most of you organizations, whether they be for-profit organizations or nonprofits or governmental entities, there's a lot of planning that goes on at the beginning of the year. You have sales quotas, sales kickoffs, budget planning. And so the reason for choosing this topic is because I want each of you, and I have every confidence that at the end of this session today, you can leave and be a hero in your organization. Because all of your organizations will have these planning sessions. And the presentation we have today, developing leads, writing your own success story, will leave you at the end of this period of time with a series of quick tips, not easy, but simple to understand, that you can implement. And you can go back with your little cheat sheet with your quick tips and say, oh, and we should do this and that. And like, whoa, listen to this person. I know they're going to California Southern University because they are way smarter than they used to be. Oh, wait, they won't say that. No, they won't say that. <laughs> And you will also have a very easy five-step guide for writing your own success story. So you can hide this Judy Johnson person who isn't nearly as highfalutin as it sounded from that intro, for which I thank you. I'm just a working mom who gets up and walks my dogs in the morning. I've already done the laundry and the dishes, so I just, you know, I'm just a working slob. But I have been working for a lot of years, and I have truly taken what I have learned over 35 years of sales and marketing big blue IBM entrepreneur, I have very much an entrepreneur's heart, and I have put it all into this presentation for you because I respect you and the fact that as I've talked to you before, you are each trying to improve your life, your business life, and those of your families, and you are making sacrifices to do that. And I really respect that. You're, you're really working hard, and so I'm gonna give you a toolkit so you can get something at the end of the day. We're gonna have some fun, but be sure you take notes. I know this is available afterwards. And then go out and be a hero. And if you get a success, send me an email and say, hey, Judy, I'm a hero. <laughs> OK, so that's how we're getting started. So you know about me, the, the only thing you really need to know about me is I started my life as a sales rep. And I absolutely believe that the job of everyone in an organization is to sell whether it be San Juan Capistrano City or whether it be a, a software company, it's all about selling, which is design supporting the customers. And so regardless of the jobs that I've had since then, I've never forgotten marketing is not about design, it's not about Facebook, it's about selling. And selling starts with leads. So this is our agenda for today. Um, lead generation, why is it important? 
And then I had these series of steps, talking about contacts, talking about lead generation techniques, lead nurturing, lead conversion, and those are really the four steps we're going to talk about. And then this next agenda item, high payoff items, is just really a summary of these tips that I'm giving you as you go along, all of which you can do without the use of any software, any fancy consultants, things you do with your brains and the things that you've learned through your education, and then the summary of writing your own success story. Easy peasy, right? All this in an hour. Look forward to your questions at the end. We got the, you know, we got the time, so write them down. The only quiz is the one you'll give yourself. Okay, I chose to talk about online marketing because, well, there's a couple reasons. Number one is the ROI of online marketing is absolutely the highest ROI in terms of lead generation. Um, with a few exceptions, if you have a very high margin, high gross, high net business, you need in-person sales. But in general, online marketing is the highest ROI. And, you know, it's all about getting value for your expenditure, whether it be money or time. Um, and the reason is because the internet attracts higher quality prospects. You probably know this at some level of your brain. But I, this is actually the only red I put in the presentation because it's kind of annoying. You see colors and explanation points. If that's on every page, there's no credibility. So I will tell you now, this is the only red you're going to see because although it's simple, this is profound, which is that you get, in general, higher quality prospects from the Internet than you get from the, you know, the offline world of telemarketing, direct mail, all those kind of things. Why? Again, you know this, but maybe it hasn't bubbled to the surface. Because people have chosen to come to you because they're interested. So if you're typing in um, open source ERP software, I have a search engine optimization client and that's what they do. This is a pretty niche thing. ERP software starts at 50,000 bucks, goes to a couple million, Open source means that they have made a really a technology decision, as you would know, to um, go to open source as opposed to something proprietary. If somebody types this in, you know, they're not looking to while away the Sunday afternoon. They are interested in that. They are inherently a very highly qualified person for something. Um, and that's so different than leafleting and cold calling and hoping you hit somebody. So the data, and I actually have a case study a little bit later, supports that there are fewer touches for a close, less time to close, and a higher close ratio with online. So that's the reason I chose this topic. Um, as a person with the MBA in finance, I love numbers. Um, as someone with a business background in marketing, I really don't like bullshit. And, um, and I get really sick of business professionals who are selling Facebook or SEO or pay-per-click or PR, and they come and they talk to you, and no matter what the problem is, what they do in their little box is a solution. That really offends me because everything should be considered fairly and objectively for your situation, and everything has a cost. And so... Um, and so what I, what I did was I have a client that I've had for more than two years, and we put together a case study with metrics, and I'm going to show some of them to you so that you can actually see the impact of different activities. Um, no bias. I have no bias. I'm not selling you anything. I don't even know who most of you people are. <laughs> I'm just here because I have a passion for sharing and educating, and because it's a tough world, you're caring enough to improve yourself, I want to help you go out and be a hero. So this two-year case study is a steel door manufacturers trade association. They have about 11, 11 manufacturers. They're essentially the 11 biggest steel door manufacturers in the US. A couple of them are multi-billion dollar companies. And so they have a trade association and they have professional uh, standards, essentially technical specifications. So they hired us to um, replace their long time print advertising agency. And so it was a really great opportunity to have a great organization, a great product or service, um, but they had done terrible marketing. And so we were able to go in and over two years roll out an online marketing program. Um, one of the first things we did was benchmark. 
benchmarking and surveys is a really important thing to do so you can go back and analyze before and after and you don't just depend upon you know great presentations where they say what a good job they did so we benchmarked um, by doing a survey and we found that their brand recognition had plummeted among people 40 years and younger and these were architects um, because you know they had been doing things the old way and so we knew that was part of our challenge we wanted to measure is our brand recognition so um, let me just show you the stats but in two and a half years their web traffic has increased threefold which is a very empirical measurement the time that people spend per viewer on the website has doubled and the number of leads in their contact list and understand they're not selling but they're trying to influence went from zero which is kind of pathetic when you think they're a 50 year old organization they had no contact database but that's not that unusual to more than 5,000 so here's the chart which is a really um, somewhat unusual to be able to have a two-year case study where everything is kept in alignment so we're excited to have this data so you can see here's kind of the 2000 mark we started August of 10 and now they're almost at 8,000 uh, page views a month um, we started search engine optimization first because SEO is is a slow to kick in I tell people it takes 6 to 12 months to get results if you're doing a national kind of a SEO keywords so we started that first we're obviously doing a lot of activities we started doing newsletters we couldn't do newsletters till we had contacts remember we started with zero so it's like what is the sound of you know a bear in the oh that's not the right example <laughs> oopsie forget that one <laughs> one hand clapping that's the one I really meant erase everyone what is the sound of one hand clapping well what is the sound of a newsletter if you have no contacts the answer is nothing so we had to get the contacts and we got the newsletters you can see little jumps as the newsletters come on um, added some online education really focused in on content so we're going to go through a lot of these steps today but to some extent you can see as you do different things you as measured by page views a month you know it goes up and up and up it's not magic it is work but essentially you 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 work the plan you get the result you just you work it and you work it you work it you will get those results as they did where do we get this data this is tip number one Google Analytics so let me ask how many of you see Google Analytics for your organization Saeed Tom okay so ask yourself and I'm going to teach you more about it if it's relevant or not but it's probably more relevant than you think Google Analytics is free and it is essentially code that Google provides free can be installed on the website in about 10 minutes and it um, it shows you web behavior number of visitors how much time on your on, on the page how much time on the site where people are coming from geographically what keywords are bringing people in and a whole lot more things I mean 50 data elements and it is really really illuminating and you could track the kind of progress I see if you have a low content um, then you won't get much time on the site per viewer people go in and they go away so so think about if it's relevant for you to be given the access to Google Analytics for your organization and it's pretty darn easy to figure it out you know obviously if you have an expert uh, you will have seen like I've seen hundreds of reports but you know you can get so far on your own without paying a penny Google Analytics is absolutely your friend um, so get it installed or get access to it uh, review it at least monthly and then if you want to take it at some point to the next level somebody can help you with more perspective but the main thing is you use it to make changes one of the things that was always my mantra in my IBM career was I don't care what the bad news is but get it to me fast that's you have to be bone honest and so with our continuing clients we're constantly looking at it and seeing how can we do a better job and you look at a website I developed a website look at it a year later it's like how could I have been so dumb-headed about that now that I've looked at the results that was not a bad idea but that's okay because you're honest you look at the data and then you improve it continuous improvement is the key so that's that is tip number one okay now we're gonna go to these four steps of lead generation the first one really is uh, the contacts that will probably be your hardest job in terms of just effort 
and organizational energy. Because in order to develop a prospect database, which is what we're talking about with context, you put them into the database and then you start working them in different ways, you've got to have names. So in addition to this trade association, which had been around 50 years and had zero names in a database, I have another client that's a, um, a, a manufacturing company in Southern California. They've been around 25 years and they do about 20 million a year. They had 300 customers, they had zero names on the database. It's like, how do you even do that? In fact, if you're that good at doing that, you'd be really good at creating a database, which is what we, we do with these clients. But when you create the database, it's hard work because the accounting people have some, different sales people have some. A lot of sales people, you know, kind of like to sit on their contacts. They think they might be going to the next job. And, you know, there's a lot of different kinds of contacts. You need to get them into a central database, but when you do, you need to decide in advance what are the segments. So whether it be, in this case, a role, a contractor, a distributor, a fabricator, or whether it be an industry, or maybe there's a couple of segments. But the thing is, if you just put them in, in a mush, you can't target the messaging. So that's the key, is that um, you really have to align the contacts, and then you want to, and I would say explicitly in writing, you want to define what is the message for that segment. And you may find that you have like, if you think of it like an X and Y axis, one might be the role, like we have here, and uh, the other segment might be an industry, like we have here. And what you need to do is define them and spend enough time so that those segments are going to last you for a year or two or three, because like with my clients, we start with zero, we end up with 2,500, we end up with 5,000. It's very hard to go back, so do get it right the first time. And you want to say, okay, do I really have a different message for this segment than that segment? And if you don't, keep them together. Or maybe you let people sign up, like on your sign up for my newsletter, with a different segment, but the fact is you compress them. But it's all about the messaging. You will have much higher conversion if you message to a segment. So you want to start with your contacts so you don't end up having to go back and redo. So um, in terms of tip number two, making contacts a priority, for those of you in, in for-profit organizations, and especially ones where perhaps they may be acquired at some point, um, think about the fact that your contacts may be worth a whole bunch of money. I mean, truly a financial asset on the balance sheet of the company if you have them segmented and you use them. So let me give you an example. Um, I have a colleague who has formed a trade association and that trade association, and he's a guy who wants to retire in five or ten years and he wanted to create an asset. And so he created a trade organization, he puts content in all the time and he's gotten up to 10,000 names of people who are engaged with this trade association. It's free to join and it's all online and there are two or three or four touches a month. He has data in a database that says how many opt out, how many open, how many click. So he has a very well touched contact list that an independent party could look at and say, wow, you have 10,000 names. These people are engaged in this fashion. No one's opting out. They're doing these things. And we were just reviewing kind of the, the finances. He thinks he's going to be able to sell that for $500,000. And he started out with the website domain and a good idea. And that is probably the most clear example you can have of how contacts have value. So um, impress everyone in your organization about that. So they're all on the, on the team. You need some kind of a database, but don't get spooked out about that. I mean, there's Microsoft Dynamics and Salesforce, and you know many of you have these. Often they work, sometimes they don't. But don't let that be a critical path because you can use eye contact or constant contact, these email distribution systems, 20 bucks a month. I use those with many of my clients for the database. It's essentially an Excel with some metrics in them. Super cheap, keep everything there. The clients, for one reason or another, are not ready to go with some more robust system. That's easy peasy, so remove that obstacle, but you do need to end up having some kind of a database, even Excel works, um, to have these, um, these segments and the different fields. 
So this is going to be, after this, everything is going to be easy. Because the contact, since it involves humans and busy people, um, but you have to remove those obstacles because you can't do it without it. Okay, now just a quick tour. This is fun. Look at this. Smartphones and mobile users, Google Analytics. January of 2011 for this 5,000 contact database, 2% of the people were on smart, smartphones or iPads, mobile, and the Google Analytics. January 11, January 12, uh, we were at about uh, 4%, and now we're at almost 8%. So look, in less than two years, it's gone from 2% to almost 8%. Mobile users, I mean, that's really exciting just professionally as a marketeer to see that. But um, some websites have a lot of flash navigation, big flash picture in the middle, and you truly, on a smartphone or iPad, cannot navigate. And some websites, everything's fine. There's almost no rhyme or reason. You've got to test it. But again, be a hero, go back, you know, borrow your kids, whatever, borrow an iPad, borrow a smartphone if you don't have one, and check the navigation, the flow through. If you're lucky, you've checked. And if you're not lucky, then you have a chance to be a hero. There's a whole range of things technically that can be done to make them compatible. There's usually some really quick, easy, I'm going to say sub thousand dollar kind of coding to change the navigation and do a couple things. Or you can go and optimize for the form factor. But the fact is, check and then do something. Because otherwise, I mean, we're talking this whole presentation about, you know, bringing in contacts and nurturing them and all this stuff. If you're just going to lose 8% off the top through stupidity or sleepiness, don't do it. So go and check. Tomorrow, today, do it. Make everything mobile friendly. OK, next thing, lead generation. So we've really talked about the contacts, which are we're, we're going to work over time to develop a relationship, uh, essentially to have when someone is ready to buy, to have them buy. Uh, lead generation. So old lead generation, pre-online, was vendor driven, right? The ads coming out at you. Annoying, costly, um, you know, essentially they're playing with the 1%, the half of 1% kind of a number. The rest of us are either indifferent or, an, or annoyed. Um, online is buyer driven. Um, like search engine optimization is really the ultimate example of that. People type something into a search engine, as I was just giving my earlier example on open source ERP, so they're seeking you. So this is the new type of lead generation, and it's much better from an ROI. Uh, this is a case study. A client of mine, we had 12 months worth of data. As you can tell, I love data. I collect it wherever I can. It holds me accountable, too. Um, and so this is a, a, a long-established company, and they are in the consulting business to the service department of auto dealerships, nationwide, leading company in the nation. They have been for years essentially doing cold calls and trade shows. You know, it's a pretty narrow industry, auto dealership service department, so it's pretty easy to find who your prospects are and, um, and just a couple of trade shows. So their sell cycle, experienced sales guys, took three to four months, you'd go and you'd Talk to the service managers, oh, they don't have the budget. You go back, you smooth them, you, you know, explain the value proposition. Their close rate, 18%, so less than one out of five closed, because they were essentially just going out to people and, and pitching. They had to discount to push people over the edge, four different touches to close. That had been their model for 15 years. When I worked for this company for a year as a um, uh, part-time VP of marketing, which is a position that I hold for some companies. And so we brought in search engine optimization. And um, so we optimized so that they had high rankings in Google for phrases that were descriptive of their industry. The sell cycle was then, with SEO generated leads, less than seven days. Close rate of 80%. They didn't have to discount. Two touches to close. Why? Because the people who were looking for them had pain. This particular company essentially sold um, security consulting expert, I mean, I'm sorry, safety consulting expertise. And especially if they like had violated some law on EPA or OSHA or someone to come in, then you know, they only have so much time that dealership does to clean it up. 
So if they have gotten busted by some organization and they're typing in, you know, OSHA automobile consultant, that person has pain. You know, you hear about pain and selling, that be pain. When you have pain and then you click and you find the company that's been the leader of this for 20, 30 years, good solid citizen, lots of references, you're going to buy and you're going to buy fast and you're not asking for a discount, you're asking for them to get out there tomorrow. So this is a perfect example of how if someone is using a search engine, they generally have pain or at least a need. And so all these metrics about discounting, about time, negotiating, it's a whole new paradigm. And how fun is that? So you want to have those people who have pain find you. You don't want to find the people that you're just cold calling and hoping you get there the day after the inspector. So a tutorial on search engine optimization. Essentially what it is is programming done by experts. Typically it's, I mean, good SEO is done by an SEO company as opposed to a web guy who Googles for do SEO. Um, and it's getting you ranked higher than you'd get without SEO. That's really the little fish getting ranked bigger, better than the big fish um, because of essentially skilled programming. And um, Google and the other search engines, but Google's 64%, so I use Google in the generic sense. But Google um, essentially rewards high Google page rank, which is to say big companies with lots of page views, longevity, lots of content, all those things that reward the IBMs, the HPs, you know, the Nikes, the big gorillas. For everybody else, you're squashed down. And so for the small company, you can't afford the kind of, especially the offline advertising of the big guys. SEO is relatively cost effective and, I mean, uh, inexpensive. Our, our company's done it for uh, 15 years now. And, you know, it's really affordable for anybody. And it's how you try to beat the big guys without spending the big bucks. It's also called organic search. So, again, just as a reminder, the stuff usually you kind of see a pink, it says an ad. This is all pay-per-click. I'm going to talk to that in a moment. That's uh, essentially the advertising, Google AdWords. SEO or organic comes just below the paid ads. And the search engines all kind of show what's paid and what's not paid. The metrics are very clear that you have about one-seventh the viewership of the paid. It's just like reading an ad versus reading an article in the newspaper. One has credibility, the other doesn't. I mean, in my view, it's usually like the cheesy little companies that do pay-per-click. And uh, Google does a better job of weeding out the riffraff. Um, and then the way it works, again, is you may never have looked at this. And so this would be kind of fun. But in fact, this will show you right here about 5,140,000 results. This shows how many links there are in Google for the term steel door manufacturers. So given that you want to be on page one, which has 10 slots, you want to be in the top 10 out of 5,140,000, pretty darn hard. Kids, you can't do this alone, right? And if you look at these on some of these searches, I mean, these numbers go to like 50 million, 100 million. And even if you're doing something really niche like open source ERP, it's probably going to be 600,000. So no matter how niche it is, there's a lot of links out there. So these are the links. And then this is the links. So the link right here, it's not only to a domain, but as you know, it's to a specific page which we would call the landing page, and we're going to talk a bit more. And then you have the web page itself, which is the, uh, the content. So you want to be sure that you have content, so when they click, they end up with content. That, so if someone types in steel door manufacturers and they see them, they got what they were looking for. If they type in steel door manufacturers and they get something unrelated, they're off to the next one, which takes them two seconds. So once you get them, you got to keep them. We're having fun, right? You're like a third of the way to being a hero, right? So just stay tuned, and by the end, you're like, whoa. OK, something else. Metrics, again, you can, again, really do this brute force on your own. Think of what your keywords are. Again, whether it be for-profit or non-profit, with my, with my door association, it's, um, in this case, like steel door manufacturers, steel door de specifications, door specifications. So you still have competitors. It's just, you know, it's not competing for a sale. And see where your different competitors are. All you have to do, I mean, I have software to do this easily. All you have to do is sit down with Google for an hour or pay your teenage kid 
and you know, just type it in and then go through and scroll through. We only looked through the first three pages, so not found means that it wasn't on the first three pages. Essentially, it's 10 a page, so 1 through 10 is on page 1, 11 through 20 on page 2, etc. Just see where you are vis-a-vis -vis your competition. With my client, then at the time we did this, we'd had SEO going for a couple of years. Again, as I mentioned, it's slow. So, you know, you can see they're, they're just pretty much kicking it, right? And, uh, but you need to start with the truth. Start with where you are. If your competitors are strong and you're weak, well, then you're playing catch up because they're getting visibility that you're not. And if they're not there, you have a chance to really do a land grab. So either way, it's a great thing to do. Pros and cons. Um, the advantages of SEO are, first of all, you get high quality leads, as we talked about. And it's credible. It's not the cheesy ads, right? It's, it's what Google has essentially aligned. Um, it's typically the pricing is a fixed budget on a recurring basis, and people keep essentially fighting the competition. And um, every year, there's more and more companies coming into your market. There's still only the top 30, and that 5 million goes to 6 million, goes to 7 million. So every year, there's more people fighting for that real estate. And every year that you have SEO, you get more and more keywords ranked because of what they call search engine credibility. So those are the strengths. Here's the disadvantages. It's slow. I tell people, it's like an ocean liner, and pay-per-click is like a speedboat. Four to 12 months to get rankings, and then you get better rankings on year two and year three, and you're, you know, you're paying the whole time because it's a constant war out there. So it's slow. If you have a crying business need, if you're launching a product, if you need, like I've worked with some clients where, like I worked for a video game company, and we were trying to sell the company to ESPN, and we wanted to really juice up our web views. We went to pay per click. We were spending $5,000 a month on it. But our viewership spiked because we had an immediate need, a pain, so to speak. And so, um, you know, but if you have the time, it's the best value. But weakness is slow. Uh, it's harder and harder to get good rankings all the time. I've done SEO now for such a long time, and it was much easier for me to get uh, quicker rankings for small companies five, ten years ago than it is today. More and more people are hiring SEO companies, et cetera, et cetera. So it's, it's tough. You have to manage your expectations. And there's a lot of shady companies out there. I used to keep all the ones from India and all the kind of weird language. Me help you get high rankings, you know, kind of thing. So um, it's kind of hard to know who a good vendor is because since it's slow and you don't know what it would be without, um, you're really having to work on reputation uh, because it's really almost impossible to measure. But if they can't spell, that's a tip. <laughs> okay, so SEO brings you high quality leads. And with the Google AdWords free tool, bullet number two, you can find the number of searches um, for, um, so just, if you just type in Google AdWords, you can find this real easy. Um, but I have so many people who first say, but nobody's looking for open source ERP online, or nobody's looking for industrial linings for tankers online. I mean, you would be surprised. So sometimes people are resistant that way. And so that what I often do is I just say, OK, let's look at the tool. And you type in something, and it will tell you how many searches there are in a month for a term. So you know, instead of just getting into some big philosophical discussion, pull up the data. Now, there are certainly some keywords that, um, that don't, you know, essentially, if it's less than 100 searches a month, it won't show up on the tool. But that's when you have to think of what your gross is and what your margin is. So if you're doing open source ERP, you really don't care if it shows up as zero searches. Because if you sell one of these puppies every five years or 10 years from SEO, you paid for the whole thing. So it doesn't matter. So you have to always keep, you know, what's the gross, what's the net, what's the competition in mind to make the best decision. Um, but in general, um, you can have data to help have an intelligent dialogue on it. Pay-per-click, uh, ads, you got the money, honey, I got the time. I mean, you could truly be number one in an hour. You give them more money than anybody else bidding on these things, you are on top. And it absolutely brings in clicks, absolutely. And so um, what people do is they need to manage it because if you, you it, it's very good about 
you know, either by the day or by the keyword or by the month, controlling the budget, because otherwise, I mean, you could spend, you know, a million bucks in a day kind of thing. Um, so you can buy your way to the top immediately, and you set the landing page for each term. So as a analytically oriented marketeer, I like this, and I use this if I want to test landing pages, test keywords. You can get, you can force to a landing page, which is what you can do with pay-per-click, whereas you can't do it with SEO. Because pay-per-click, you have the right to essentially give them the landing page where SEO Google determines it. So you can test landing page A versus landing page B. The very large consumer companies, the Procter's and Gamble's, the Avon's, they do this A-B testing all the time to see what is the messaging and the imaging that has the right results. Um, that's expensive, and for many of us, it's not relevant. But it's beautiful as a market research tool. You pay literally per click. Uh, so I talked about it being time intensive. And the click fraud, which bothers a lot of people, because like anyone could be clicking. I mean, it could be your competitor sitting there chuckling and you know drinking a latte and just click, 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 and every time. And you can see what you know. A lot of these terms are you know five bucks a click or something. You work pretty hard for that money, and then someone's just sitting there, or um, bots sometimes do it. So you just kind of have to accept that's part of the price. And you know credibility issues, um, you know, and it's paid. But having said that, I mean, I I have a couple clients who like. If we don't have pay-per-click, the phone's not ringing, and it's worth it to them. They have a high gross, high margin product. So there's absolutely a place for it, but it's not where you start. OK, now this is maybe going to be a little bit of a surprise. Um, YouTube. I, I've been thinking about YouTube for a long time, because we started doing videos for our industrial customers how to make a steel door. It's like, boy, that's a winner. Well, guess what? We've had 30,000 views for our steel, steel door series. Yeah, it's like, who would have thought? Um, so it really is a land grab. And since I was in SEO really truly before, it was even called SEO way at the beginning, and I've seen how hard it is now to get rankings, like, oh my gosh, if only these people had started with me 10 years ago. It's kind of that situation, the way I see it with YouTube. Um, there are rewards for being early adopters. So it's owned by Google. That probably explains a whole bunch, and I don't need to really spell this out to you. It's owned by Google, same search engine thing, same kind of ranking, the popular guys bubble up, paid advertising, the whole deal. So again, um, the thing also is that actually how-tos are the most popular on YouTube. It's actually not the cute pet tricks thing. Um, very, very popular for how-tos, including, you know, for, you know, commercial, industrial, all those kinds of things. So, um, so we are, within my own clients, really starting to have a pretty big video campaign. And the production standards can be pretty low. I mean, maybe not quite with your iPhone, but really the next step up. They're short. It's really about content being non-promotional being very informative. And so, you know, I encourage you to think about video. So many people process things with video, whether you be a city or a nonprofit. Uh, with this nonprofit that I'm dealing with with door standards, we're going to make 20 videos next year on steel door standards. And we think we're going to scoop the competition because we have competitors and everyone has these standards, which, you know, the older architects use, and that's really important. But the younger architects, they'd rather get the quick, you know, three-minute version on a video. We think we're going to scoop them, and then we think we're going to dominate the rankings. So don't tell the other organizations, but here we come. So I'm very, very bullish on YouTube. Check out the competition. So one of the things we do now is before, just like the analysis we do with SEO, is we maybe get a list of 20 different videos we might do, put them into the YouTube search engine, see what comes up, see if we think we could beat them. Like when we were doing one of fire rated doors, um, then the first one was like someone made in India. And like there were guys like throwing straw on the fire. And we're like, well, we can totally beat that one. And, um, and so you kind of check out the competition. And then we actually go to Google AdWords and look on the, on the Google on the print side and see what are popular searches. And you go back and forth. So you use some intelligence and some data to decide where you think there's a big audience and where the competition is weak, and, um, and then you go for it. 
Um, lead generation, getting signups, just a quick, these, you could have a whole long discussion on it, but essentially this is a challenge and we have to adopt to changing expectations. Kind of the convention, especially like in software companies, is you have a white paper like boring white paper on how to bifurcate database algorithms. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> click here, register, and we'll send you the paper. A and that used to work, but now there's so much stuff that's free, much more concerned, appropriately so, about privacy. And so this register for a white paper, don't bother to have that conversation. It just don't work anymore. You have to have something even more compelling. Why should they sign up? So for example, um, with the, the steel door, then um, the standards, the architects want the standards. The standards are actually free, but when they're updated, people don't especially know that. We went to a trade show. We statistically surveyed the audience. Do you know you can get standards? Yes. Do you know that we can, in fact, tell you when they're changed? No. Would you like to sign up for our newsletter? Yes. So, you know, essentially we got the feedback that every architect, although they knew they could get them reactively, they wanted to be told about them proactively. And so we got all these signups. And so we actually went and put on our website this really cheesy button, which we were almost embarrassed because it's so garish. But in fact, our feedback had been nobody knew they could sign up for a newsletter to get standards. And when they did, they did. So we said, eh, what the heck, we'll be cheesy. And um, sometimes cheese sells, right? It's the other thing that sells. <laughs> OK, lead nurturing. How are we doing on time? We're good? OK. Lead. We're having fun, right? Thank you. If you're not careful, I'm going to come back next week. <laughs> I'll haunt you. OK, lead nurturing. So um, I want to talk about this term. There's a great term, drumbeat marketing. Touch, touch, touch. You have to remind people every so often that you, what you do and why you do it and why they care in a non-promotional fashion. So now let's go back to the contact list. These are a bunch of people that say who want to buy. In this case, these are um, industrial linings, so facility managers. And they don't know that you know, we have 25 different products and these services and this and that because when we first engaged them, they had one piece of pain and we solved that one piece of pain, but they don't know all the other stuff we do. So every so often you touch them with a newsletter or something else. In this case, the newsletter is a perfect example of lead nurturing. And um, you remind them what you do, but you do that within a theme. So for example, with, these, with this client, we decided before we started our newsletter on our ground rules. Number one, always technical, never promotional. Number two, our brand differentiation was more kinds of materials and more applications, more high techy you might say, than our competitors. And so we decided that every newsletter we would have something very educational and techy. In this case, this is something called the cold wall effect. We would always have a customer story about a benefit, and we would always have a block it was really kind of technical content block. And, um, and so we're reminding people, but every time they get a newsletter, it is done with great consciousness of what our brand identity is. So even if they are not have no need now or never will have for a particular product or service, they are still getting the reinforcement of the brand, which is, I may not be interested in this, but wow, this is really a cool material, and this reflects well in this company. So. Um, Email marketing, drumbeat marketing. How frequently? Quarterly in general is just kind of my rule of thumb. If you get too enthusiastic once a month, you're never going to get it done. And the key is to have a template to keep the cost down because everything we do is about return on investment. So once you have a template, you have a clear brand, then you could whip these things out pretty darn quickly. Um, and then what we do is, um, we actually sometimes we vary them by segment. So in this particular case, November 3rd, 2011, we had two. One was for our segment, water filtration, and the other was for a different segment. All we did was we changed the email subject line. One said water filtration, so if someone's a water filtration guy in our segment that's nicely segmented in our contact list, they see water filtration. They feel you're talking to them. Change the first, the headline. 
change the first paragraph to throw in the word water filtration. Other than that, it was the same thing. Cost us 50 bucks more to segment it into two messages that, that make you speak directly to those people. So again, it's important to keep these costs down. And once you have these segments, you can do that very quickly and easily. And as you all know intuitively, the conversion rate is much higher when it goes to a segment. Uh, one thing I love about the email marketing is that there's some very good vendors and they're low cost. 20 bucks a month, you can have 5,000 contacts, send as many things as you want. Um, and you can get data on the open rate, tells you the open rate. And then you could actually click and it will tell you every email address that opened it. So your sales guys, this is gold. You tell your sales guys this, you know, they can call the people that open the newsletter. You have to kind of finesse it, which salespeople are good at, so you're not like creeping them out, you know, like I see you opened it. But, but in fact, that is an indicator of interest, right? And you can tell if they clicked, which is the next level of indicator of interest. Did they click? So here we had 376 contacts. Um, uh, and 631 clicks. So in your newsletter, you want your newsletter to go to more information on the website. So when you do a newsletter, then you want to have web, sometimes you want to have a PDF. So you might say, let's do a newsletter, but you're really saying, let's do a 360 degree program using and reusing content um, so you're not wasting your resource and you get people coming and going. Um, and then you find out the unsubscribes. You know, it's kind of funny. You're like, oh, that jerk, I didn't like him anyhow, right? Or, oh, yeah, he moved or whatever. So you are getting information on an individual email basis, which for your salespeople is very good. And they will have the perspective to process that information. Using and reusing content. Um, you know, think of it as a solar system, right? The content is the sun in the center. And then you have web, and you have email, and you have you know, all these different ways of reusing the content. One thing that, well, someone called me up and they'd heard of me and the guy called and he said, I'm such a snob, <laughs> he said, um, he said, I want you to do um, some press releases for us. I said, no. I was like, what? You know, isn't everyone starving? And I was like, no. That doesn't make any sense to only do press releases. Let's talk about what you're trying to communicate. Let's look at all the different ways you want to communicate it. Let's talk about communicating it more than once. Then we could have a conversation. Otherwise, it's just a waste. The best newsletter, actually, that's kind of macabre, but the highest open rate I ever had for a newsletter was when the founder of a company died. Um, but in fact, it was a caring company, a family company, and the guy died. My client called me up and they said, I want to get this out quickly before the word goes out just via the grapevine. And so we got the newsletter out in about three hours and um, very well-respected person, everybody opened it. Normally, uh, constant contact says 10% is good, 15% is great. Uh, my clients, we typically get between about 21 and 35% open. I'm hugely competitive and it's like, okay, we're gonna, we're gonna beat everybody else's open rates. Um, but in fact, um, you, your best newsletter, a quarter of them are gonna open it. So three quarters aren't gonna open it. You work so hard on that content and you had meetings and you hired a graphics guy maybe and whatever, whatever. Don't waste that stuff. So you're going to put it maybe in a press release on your website. Maybe you're going to send it out. Um, you know, do all these things with it so that if someone was busy and they didn't see it the first time, then they'll see it the second or the third or the fourth time. Uh, so just think of the content as a center. How many times can you use and reuse it? When we do newsletters and we do custom graphics, which is kind of expensive, we make sure we turn it into a data sheet. Essentially, you take the newsletter, you take out a little bit of the extra stuff, you plop it on a PDF, and you got a data sheet. Cost 200 bucks. So use, reuse, and reuse. Social media is not on the topic today. Um, so I just wanted to have one slide that says, I'm cautious in my, in, with my client base, uh, primarily industrial, also technology, about um, social media. Um, and I think the thing to do is look and see what your competitors are doing in social media, but then look and see if there's engagement, because the point of social media is engagement, community development. And lots of companies have some young person, they're more than happy to be putting things on Facebook or Twitter. The question is, is anything coming back? Um, 
And so we benchmark these for some of our clients and our competitors. In general, they may have built up even some likes through like friends of the family thing. But if you're not getting engagement, just consider if it's worth it, very case by case basis. And also, what's the risk of trying it and then undoing it? Probably in general, not a lot. Um, but I am very cautious about um, investing resource because it's a beast that has to be fed so frequently. So, um, uh, you know, whereas a newsletter is something less frequent and can be used in more ways. So, uh, just caution. Okay, uh, last of these items is lead conversion. So we have the contacts, we brought more contacts in, put them in our database, we're nurturing these, and now we need to get them to convert, which is to say to, to do some action, to call us, to email us. At that point, it goes to the sales guys. Again, we're marketing. Marketing is the engine that fuels sales. Sales completes the action. Um, so the website, your, the website, which we haven't really talked about websites very much, that's really the key for lead conversion. Um, and you want to have navigation and messaging for each segment. So when you're looking at your website, often there's a, um, horizontal and vertical navigation these days. Like one might be a role, like I'm a learner, I'm a mentor, I'm an employer. So that might be role-based, and another might be by a discipline business, psychology, whatever. And the same person is interested in both the X and Y axis. So you want to speak to them in whichever way they prefer to process information at that point in time. So your navigation is hugely important. And then you want to think, what is your message for that segment? And be sure it's there. Um, and then for your SEO, you need to have landing pages. Again, with SEO, it's not like pay-per-click where they're kind of off in the ad space, it's within the website itself. So you need to think, okay, I always like to do SEO for clients before they do a new website if we have that luxury because that way that can influence your navigation and your use of language. But you want to have the landing pages. And Google Analytics um, will help you see on your current website what are the pages that are uh, most viewed. And that is hugely important and it's pretty darn easy and low cost to swap your navigation around a little. So what we do with our clients is we go in and we look at, on the home page, you know, looking at all the tabs on, you know, horizontal and vertical, which ones are viewed the most, and then we'll kind of, you know, vote somebody off the island if they're not being viewed very much, because everything you have competes against everything else, and move the most popular ones in general to the left, while respecting kind of the convention of website navigation. Um, but constant improvement so that if people are really interested in something, make it more and more visible to them. And having a call to action on each page. So again, just go back and review. I mean, you'd be surprised how many have like little teeny print for the phone number or you have to go to contact us to get the phone number. Don't make it hard, you know, for people to find you. You know, just one of those things that you like, oh shoot, I never really thought about that. So this is a website, we just did a 100 page website for a pet food company. and. Um, and so um, as we were deciding on the different pets, we essentially looked to see, number one, what's the revenue for the different animals? And number two, looking at the current website, which animals were clicked on the most? Horses won, right? They're on the left. Chickens were number two. So, you know, birds, they're like down at the bottom. But essentially, people start left and go right. And again, we use both an icon and we use text. Different people process information differently. And then you have the animals. It was really a fun website to do. Um, so different ways, but essentially we use that data. Um, they had their w previous website, they've been like throwing things up for years. So again, we looked at Google Analytics to see what people were actually looking at. Because um, you get very invested in your website and like, oh, I really want everyone to know about this. Well, the fact is maybe nobody cares but the owner. And, and so rather than have this confrontation, you say, that's fine, I understand that, but let's just look at the data. No one's looking at you but you and your mother, you know? <laughs> so, um, so anyhow, it, it helps you have a fact-based discussion. Microsites, in this particular case, a microsite is an interior page that looks like a website in and of itself. So we don't do them really often because usually it's kind of an integrated company, but in this case with the pet people, um, 
And sometimes that's like true maybe for a city. You might have like a parks and rec microsite. Um, and, and so it has its own navigation. Products frequently ask questions, certifications. And so, you know, it has tabs. So it's, it's really like its own site while you're keeping kind of some of the company stuff over on the left. So it, it has a different look, which is very self-contained. And when you have landing pages, like we have SEO terms for things like poultry feed, then we try to get it to go straight to that microsite. So they're not seeing all the animals, they're only seeing the poultry. So again, it's a segmentation um, that works very well. And then calls to action. Um, so, you know, phone numbers in big prints, request a quote, this cheesy button that has been so effective for us. Um, this, is, this is kind of the old school, this is a free tool, kind of the equivalent of a, you know, sign up and give us your information and we'll send you a white paper. This particular company, they think they have something that's better than a white paper, it's a tool, and they've had some success with it. So, you know, they're testing the boundaries to see if it's compelling enough to get people to essentially give them information for a sales call. Um, and, um, and a class enrollment, one of the things we're doing more of with our clients is um, setting up classes, either they're accredited through a trade association or something professional, because then you're really engaging in 45 minutes of learning, you know, and, and so that's a true value to them, and you're getting people who now have a very good thought of your brand. So these are all calls to action, um, and they're, you have to give real thought to them because people are a harder sell than they used to be. Um, okay, so now we're really at the summary, which is to say we're going to talk about all these tips I've been throwing at you. Live and breathe Google Analytics. Okay, you guys, you all drank the Kool-Aid, right? Okay, that's it. I mean, if it weren't free, it'd be a little harder, but it's like free. Contacts, they really are a huge asset. Should be on the balance sheet, really. All touch points mobile friendly. This is a quick one for you to do. SEO, high quality leads tends to be your lowest cost for lead generation. And recycling content. So if someone comes and they say, hey, I'm a PR company, throw them out. You're not looking for PR company. You're looking for content company. And there are many good content companies, but just be sure you use it and reuse it. And then calls to action. These are all easy, right? You're a hero. OK, and then to write your own story. So just to summarize, develop your contacts. They tend to kind of go in stepwise fashion. It's like you get a whole bunch of them from somebody. Sometimes you get them from a trade association. You can mine them from the internet. Um, you know, we had a client who wanted to find all of the um, locksmiths north of the Mason-Dixon line and east of Chicago. I mean, go figure, there's somebody for everything. You know, gave them 278, took us about five hours of research because we hit the jackpot on locksmiths. Well, sometimes you're lucky. So anyhow, they tend to go up in, in bunches, but they'll go up, up, up. And I have monthly meetings with my clients and we look at their contacts, we look at their unsubscribe rates, we, we look at all this data because if you snooze, they start to go down, they get old, people change jobs. So hold yourself accountable. Lead generation, so getting people to self-select in. Brand awareness, which can kind of go up forever. Um, and that is usually paid advertising. And there are some great paid advertising opportunities. You need to look for them. I mean, in general, um, online advertising, trade associations, buying portals, it's still an economically um, irrational market because it's, it's in its infancy. So you can find some things that are, I mean, like in, in the construction business, there is a portal. It's a thousand bucks a year. And for my clients who are on it, they are getting like, it's like number one, number two source of leads after SEO. Because, you know, this guy's in Canada, he's a happy guy, he's making enough money and he's just pricing it low. And then you try something else and it's high. It's an irrational market. So, you know, if you're a shopper, it's like, there's a bargain out there and I'm gonna find it. And, um, and so I absolutely think there's a place for building brand awareness through, uh, especially online advertising, because it can be cheap. Search engine visibility starts very slow, improves, kind of has a finite cap to it, because if you're on page one of Google, it's a ton of that, as good as you're gonna get. Lead nurturing, so you tend to have newsletter, YouTube newsletter kind of thing. It tends to be stepwise, but essentially, as long as you have contacts, you gotta nurture the contacts and watch those numbers. If you start to send something and you're getting a big unsubscribe rate, it's your fault. It's not them. You have done something wrong. You have a very clear discussion. 
What do I need to do to keep that rate down? And then lead conversion, measure it a number of uh, views a month. That can go up forever. It's a big world out there. Time on the website, usually the lowest you ever see is about a minute, and the highest you ever see is about three minutes, so it's, it's you know, doesn't go that high. But there is a big, big difference between someone spending a minute and three, and if you do big content push, measure before, measure after. See where it's going. Those are your four steps. And when you do them, you'll get leads. It's a system. You work the system. You got the system done. That is it. Easy peasy. <laughs> thank you. Great. Judy, thank you so much. Yeah. We've got, you have some time for questions here? I do indeed. Great. Well, I'm going to start out with a few from the uh, virtual audience and give the uh, in-person audience a chance to gather their thoughts. Uh, this first question I thought was an interesting one. Say you have a company um, that's doing both uh, uh, SEO and paid search. Yeah. And uh, so they have the budget for paid. If they begin to dominate the organic listings, is there still, do you still recommend, uh, and, and they're having some success with paid, is, is paid necessary at that point if you're dominating the, the organic? What, do you do both? Yeah. Do you drop That paid? is a great question, and in fact, that is a strategy that, that um, the, the person has said, which is we often, well, I have an example now actually with a client that does x-ray glass, and they've been using pay-per-click, we've been doing SEO. The x-ray glass term is actually uh, about um, uh, 12 bucks. So as we are getting SEO now on page one, then we are stopping the pay-per-click. Uh, there are a number of questions coming in regarding right. con content. Uh, with video and all the other content you described, uh, a, a key point that you stressed again and again is that you want it to be informative and not uh, self-promotional. However, uh, a learner notes, I mean, you, 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 see, you don't want to waste an opportunity. Is there a way to subtly ask for the sale or maybe put a call to action around the content? Is there a way to subtly introduce some sort of uh, a promotional aspect without um, corrupting the, you know, the inf informative aspect of the content. You're doing it without knowing it. Essentially, you have your email address, you have your logo. They know you're selling stuff. That's good enough. That you don't have to tell someone, call me. I want. I want an order. You're out there doing it. So um, give them credit. They know you're selling. Mm -hmm. And uh, an another content-related question, and, and the, the learner apologizes because they're sort of asking for a trade secret. But a as you uh, work so hard to increase your open rates, what have you uncovered? What, have you uncovered any best practice? What are there commonalities that lead to increased open rates? And, and do you mind yeah, well, sharing? Thanks, them? and I don't mind. Everything I have is yours. Um, uh, essentially, content, content, and then I would say an honest post-newsletter discussion, look and see who's opening them. So it, again, drill down. It's not just the open rates. Your salespeople know who's opening them. If the guys opening them are the ones you want, yay. OK. Great. And I'll ask one more from the uh, online, uh, online audience here really quickly. Uh, one of the most uh, attractive aspects of online marketing, as you've noticed, is the an have you, as you pointed out, is the analytics, the data you receive. But uh, this learner points out that there's so much of it, and uh, she's found herself on occasion drowning in it. Do you have any tips or guidance as to how to identify and, and track the right data, the right yes. metrics? Yes. I'll tell you, I'll tell you it's simple. Look at the page views. Look at the time on site. Look at the most popular pages. Look at the mobile, which you only kind of have to look at once. And that's kind of the web stuff that's most important. You might want to look at the geography, see if you're getting a whole bunch of Ukrainians or whatever, or if it's in your geography space. Those are some really good ones to start with. Sorry. Is uh, LinkedIn a good data mining source, or should one use LinkedIn? Well, there? LinkedIn is, of course, as you know, more than half the revenue now comes from headhunters. And in fact, um, uh, it's very, very popular with recruiters. For a, a company, um, we use LinkedIn as kind of just a, a very low resource one-time billboard to get your company up there. There is a problem with LinkedIn and that if you have a company, LinkedIn, it will show everybody who used to work for your company too. And usually the people who left, some of them, you don't really want them to be associated. So I think there are risks to LinkedIn. Something that has been used um, with some of our clients is to be in a LinkedIn forum, uh, so, you know, if you're in human resources software. So I think uh, a, it's a selective yes. As an individual, absolutely. Steve. 
Hello, Judy. Thanks for the nice presentation. Thank you. I have a question. I'm in a business 87300 course, which is statistical analysis. And I was wondering, do you use any professional statistical analysis programs to do sample testing uh, for, uh, to, de to develop population characteristics in the course of setting up your programs and rolling it out for clients? And if so, which programs would you recommend? Thank you. Um, I do not. I have in the past, especially in my IBM days. Uh, but I would say that most of my clients are people with no contacts in their newsletters. So we're really kind of starting at the beginning. But I am a big fan, as one deals with more sophisticated needs, um, I am a big fan of using statistical analysis. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Another uh, question from the online audience. Uh, this learner understands that Google constitutes 64% of the search engine traffic, but that still leaves a significant amount of uh, search volume out there. How difficult is it, or time consuming, to, uh, to optimize across all the major search engines? All the search engine companies optimize for essentially the top 97%. So like with our own company, we give reports from I think eight or nine search engines, which pretty much are in the high 90s. So you use different techniques for different search engines. You as a consumer don't really need to be concerned about that. Um, you almost don't even need to bother to ask your search engine company if they do all the search engines, because they do. Uh, a similar question. Uh, is optimizing a site for smartphones and tablets a single process, or is that a, is that, do you have to optimize for each? Um, okay, there's a couple parts of that question, I, and let me uh, get into it quickly, because it's an excellent question. Number one, is it because of form factor? Um, iPads are big, smartphones are little, there's a form factor issue. Um, the way the websites work is actually when a device queries them, it can read what the device is, and so it can automatically adjust. Um, so it is done differently for smartphones, all essentially similar form factor than from iPads, but your, com your programmer can worry about that. There is a second step of optimizations that I didn't get to, but that is really true redoing of the user interface for a form factor on a smartphone. That's, depending on your client base, that may be something worthwhile. That's really a programming job for a person who is a user interface expert, of which there are more and more. Thank you. Yes, Judy. So um, I'm interested in the landing page and the content. So typically, I've, I've seen a lot of companies actually spend a lot of time and effort and money to try to get, regardless of the methodology you, to use to get someone to your landing page, only to have the message so convoluted that they just decide to leave. Do you have any strategies as to what type of content should be there in the landing page? Terrific. Three sentences. Keep it simple, right? And that's why when you go through the discipline of messaging for segment, then you make it very, very net. With my rubber lining company, it's like widest variety of materials. And, you know, west of the Mississippi. It's like keep it very, very net. I'm in the psychology department and will be developing my own small business. Uh, is there a way to maximize YouTube, which is a short message, and then send people to your website to give them the more in-depth content? Um, it will be difficult because YouTube will, um, assuming you're talking about the free, not the paid search, um, it will be very hard for you to make a video and to get it to be ranked high, um, you know, it tends to favor giants. So mm -hmm. you're better to kind of come up with other ways to generate traffic and send them to YouTube, and then over time you create a YouTube channel. So you could have a channel that has your company name on it and then have two or three or four and they're all linked. So I wouldn't look to them to generate leads or visibility for you, but I would use it as a way to have engagement. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Google and the other engines work really hard to fight click fraud. Click fraud. Is it still an extensive problem? Has, has there been much progress made in the last uh, three to five years, or are the fraudsters still always a step ahead of the game? Um, OK, so again, to remind you, click fraud is on pay-per-click when people click on the link when they're not a legitimate buyer. So I would really, although they claim that they worked very hard to combat click fraud, and I, I don't dispute that, like blocking off you know, like Estonia and things like that, um, the fact is, if someone's in the U.S., you don't really know if they're a student and is that fraud or not. 
or if it is your competitor. So, you know, while there's some of the, they deny there's as much click fraud as our experience shows there is naturally because you're paying good money. And they're doing what they can do with technology, but what they can't do is get inside the, the heads and intentions of people. There's a second part to that that I forgot to ask. If you do discover click fraud, is there a recourse? Can you get some of your uh, expenditures back from, from Google or the other engines? I don't know. I would doubt it because they're a process in the volume business and it's 50 cents a click. So is it going to be worth your time to try to get back 50 cents or $5? Uh, I think you'd better just decide it's part of the cost. And whatever the cost of the click is, add 25% or 50% and see if you can live with it. Um, in a former life, I worked in um, online marketing. And with the click fraud, it depends on how extensive it is. But if you do have a, a huge problem and you can track it back to a certain person, there has been um, cases where you have been refunded the money. But it, those were huge cases. Yeah, and is it worth your time? Thank you. Can you limit your? Can you put a cap on absolutely. the click so you say absolutely? 5, 000, they are in fact perfect about you can you can limit by the day, you can limit by the word. There are many many limits because of course with you know five thousand links or clicks or whatever, I mean there has to be. So it's the system, They want you to be satisfied. You know it's just it is what it is. But there is not an intent to run away with an open checkbook. Thank you. Okay, I've been saving this one for last. Uh -huh. uh, in online marketing, there's always a new application or platform that some vendor is, is pushing right. on you. And you, you, you mentioned that there's an advantage in some cases to being an, an early adopter, but at the same time, you don't want to be you know, chasing every shiny object that comes along. Do you have any advice uh, on how to assess or test these new platforms and make the decision whether to pursue it immediately or not? Yes, and I'm, that is a good kind of a closing question. So essentially, I have done the 101 step, and then just like in your school, there's a 201 and a 301. So you always like to get the return on investment from the simple stuff first. And then as you are you know, more sophisticated, you have your own marketing staff, um, then move to the next and the next. And there are particular tools that I like very much are um, uh, largely for high volume retail kind of operations where they will actually take people b depending on their action through this touch and that touch and that touch and that touch and there are a number of vendors now that essentially once you get a contact based on their parameters you program it for a series of recurring actions so like in the newsletter right now we just send it out once every quarter but in these more sophisticated systems you essentially start day one with each contact and then have it those are some excellent systems and I know people have good success so uh, that's probably for another day but this is really the basics and it can get very very sophisticated those are all the questions we have uh, first and foremost I'd like to uh, on behalf of the entire university I'd like to thank you for uh, thank such you. an informative and compelling lecture pleasure. we're so fortunate that you joined us today Thank you.